is a very, very uh, significant person in the 451st Bomb Group. He's a veteran, a nose gunner, but I think almost as importantly is what he has done in his lifetime in uh, civilian mode. Uh, Aki Kantakis has probably talked to more school children than anyone I know from the uh, Air War of Europe. And uh, uh, he's uh, always available when called upon, <laughs> such as he didn't know until about two hours ago that he was going to be on the program today. <laughs> but, you know, with the illness that bestalls all of us and so forth, why things change rapidly, people cancel their flights, and uh, so Aki is kind enough to step in, and I knew he would do this and help us. And uh, he's going to be talking about the best seat in the house. So Aki, it's nice to have you. I'm going to share with you some of my experiences when I was in the 726 Bomb Squadron, 451st Bomb Group, during World War II, of course. And uh, this is the Emperor II speech now. All of, I'm talking to you what's popping out of my head. <laughs> okay. I was a member of a replacement crew. And when we arrived on our base, 726 Squadron, uh, Captain Ford was, a, was the... Uh, <clears throat> he was a speaker at the time inviting us to the squadron. And he, he told us that all enlisted men, six of us, would report to the supply sergeant. The officers would report to the officer's section of the squadron. Well, the six of us, we walked over to the supply tent, and there's the supply sergeant. He issues us a tent, 16 foot by 16 foot. He also issues each guy a cot and a mattress cover and two blankets and a helmet, a steel helmet, no liner, just a helmet. Well, what are we going to do with a helmet and what are we going to do with a mattress cover? We don't have a mattress. <laughs> but we learned in a hurry. When we set up our tent, he says, you can set up your tent anywhere in the enlisted men's area. Well, we went there, we looked around, we set up our tent, and the tent, of course, doesn't have a door or anything, it all has canvas, and winter's coming on. That's a campus door. So I'm talking with the boys in the tent, we gotta do something. We need a stove, we need hot water to bathe. So let's look around the squadron and see who has what. And let's see if we can requisition something. Well, we spent two days looking around the squadron. We didn't requisition anything. You don't steal from your own squadron. So one name kept cropping up. And the name was Thirsty. I said, what the hell is this guy's thirsty? He must drink a lot of something with a name like that. And he's over in the 60th Service Squadron, which is about a quarter of a mile from our squadron. Well, I said, boys, we got to do something. Well, at that time, I had four-fifths of whiskey in my B4 bag. I guess you could say I was street smart when I bought the whiskey, because I don't drink. Well, anyway, I took a fifth of whiskey the next day, put it in my field jacket, and headed for the 60th Service Squadron to find Thirsty. Well, I looked around 20, 30 minutes, and I saw this casa. A nice house built with tuba block, you know, that sandstone block? Uh -huh. And it was about 30 feet long, 20 feet wide, and I looked outside of there, on an A-frame, they had these droppable tanks. And from the tanks, they had hoses going into the building. I said, God, now these guys have got showers in their house. <laughs> well, I knocked on this door, big door, and I'm knocking on it, and about a minute or so later, a, a gruffy sergeant comes at the door, he looks down at me, two steps up to his floor, and he says, what the hell do you want? 
And here I am, a fuzzy face, corporal, you know. And I looked up, I said, Sarge, I want to know, does Thirsty live here? He says, yeah. Well, can I talk to him? And he says, yeah, he's laying in his bunk. So I walk in that castle, they had wood floors, they had four bunks, there were all men in there, they even had a, a bookcase about four foot high. You see the stars and stripes, the magazines are there, Yank magazine, and there's Thirsty lying on his bunk like this, and he had his fatigue cap over his eye, just laying there. So I walked up to his bunk, and I was about three feet before I got to the foot of his bunk. I said, are you thirsty? I'd like to talk to you. He, he didn't move or nothing. He says, what the hell do you want? <laughs> so this fuzzy face kid says, I need a, a door for my tent. I need a stove. I need some jerry cans for hot water. And I want a bunk. I cannot sleep in a damn cot for the duration. I need a bunk. And he says, what makes you think I get you all those things? And I just stepped forward a step, and I pulled out that fifth of whiskey, and I went like this. I said, this is yours if you deliver the goods. He popped over, he jumped over there, tried to grab the whiskey, of course, I pulled back. I said, look, Thirsty, this is yours. And you know there's more where this comes from, because all the guys that are flying, when they come back from a mission, you get a two ounce shot of a hundred proof ride. He says, come on, sit down, sit down, let's talk. So I sat down there, and uh, he was an Italian boy from New Jersey. And I forgot his name, but I remember Thirsty. <laughs> so he was telling me about how he could requisition, requisition that. I said, look, if you can deliver this stuff in four or five days, I'll give you this fifth of whiskey. He says, all right, Greek. He couldn't pronounce my name. All right, Greek. Four or five days. I promise. I'll do it. So he drives me back to my tent so he knows where we are. And four days pass, nothing. And on the fifth day, we hear a jeep out front of our tent. All the six of us came out there, and there was Thirsty with all the goods. <laughs> door. He, boy, he set that door up like a pro. And he made a bunk for me. And I said, hey, Thirsty, where's the springs? He says, great, no springs. And what he had is frag bomb boxes, the slats. That was my bed. <laughs> and he put the stove up. He made the stove now out of a 50-gallon drum. And he had three angle irons for legs. And under the drum, he drilled the hole. Uh, burnt a hole with a welding torch, and he welded about a section, about a 14, 16 inch section of a 75 millimeter shell casing. And he burnt holes in the casing, about half inch holes, all the way around the casing. And at the bottom of the casing, he had a handful of pebbles. And they welded that back on the, the bottom of the drum. On the top of the drum, he burnt a four inch hole and there was our vent stake going up through the tent. Uh -huh. And that was our heater. And outside he put an A-frame, had another 50-gallon drum, and that was 100 octane gas in there. <laughs> and everything was gravity. For the lines, he used the oxygen lines for the planes. See, those guys had first cuts on everything. And he connected everything, and he made, set up my bunk, and I said, look, I need a top of my bunk, so I put my B4 bag and my A3 bag, which had all my flying gear in it. I didn't have to have it on the floor, because the floor was earth, no wooden floors. Well, anyway, he delivered what we wanted. I gave him that fifth of whiskey. I said, Thirsty, any time you come by, I'll have a shot for you. <laughs> shot of whiskey. <laughs> and he delivered everything like we asked him to. Put up the tent, the door, the whole nine yards. Well, that's how we got accustomed to the 726 squadron. You know, we were like a stepchild in a large family. You know, be a replacement crew. Well, 
That took care of Thirsty. That took care of Kasakis with his bunk. And the rest of the crew was happy too because we had a door that kept out the winter. That's one story. Now I'm going to tell you another one. This just popped out of my head. <laughs> you know, a lot of you guys probably went to a, a display of ice sculpture where they had statues made out of ice. Well, that room was about nine degrees above zero, so the ice wouldn't melt. The statues wouldn't melt. Well, when we were flying at 24, 25,000 feet, the temperature were frigid. A warm day would be a minus 39 degrees below zero. Uh -huh. A cold day would be 60 degrees above zero. I mean, below zero. And the wind chill factor at 60 was a minus 148 degrees. So we had a dress to combat this cold. And I'm going to tell you how I dressed. You know, and if you had your hand exposed for 30 seconds, in that temperature, it'd be frozen solid. They'd have to cut it off. But I'm going to tell you how I started to dress. I had my t-shirt, my long underwear, and my woolen socks. Now, on top of that, I put on my heated flying suit. Now, the heated suits we had were made of nylon. And they had wires sewn through in the threads of the nylon. Nice silky, snug fit, you know? Just nice, not tight or anything. And I put that with booties, boots for your feet, up to your ankles, your pants, and your jacket. And they had plug snap in to connect for electrical, then you had an electrical cord about three foot long, put it in a receptacle, thermostat, and you control your heat. That was nice. Now you know, not like today, the way some of the girls wear their blue jeans. Now that's tight. <laughs> we had snug fit. Well, on top of that, I put on my old D pants, my olive drab with the issue pants. On, I didn't wear my old D shirt because it used to make me itch around the neck, and I wore my khaki shirt. And on my khaki shirt, I had my stripes and the Air Force emblem on it. Now, I did that for two reasons. One reason, in the Geneva Convention, all sergeants and above do not have to pull duty, work duty, daily duty. And General Hapano was a pretty sharp general. He made all the gunners sergeants. <laughs> so we didn't pull any details if you were POW. That was one reason. Now the other reason why I wore my shirt with my stripes if I got shot down, they couldn't accuse me of being a spy. And they shoot you on a spot. And that's what I wore. Now on top of that, I put on my summer flying suit. The reason is, I can get in and get out of it real easy. One big zipper, and bingo, you're in or out. Huh. Now, I'm pretty well dressed for the winter. And I'm going to put on my winter issue flying suit. It consisted of my boots, my pants, and my B-10 jacket. The B-10 jacket is lined with alpaca wool. Oh man, very warm, soft, and silky. I still have mine, by the way. And uh, the pants were made the same way, the same lining, alpaca, and the boots were a sheepskin top with a zipper and two belts, buckles and the bottom was rubber. And those boots, if you didn't tighten those top straps, if you jumped, when you hit the airstream, bingo, your boots are gone. So I always made sure my boots was tight. Now on top of that, I put on my May West. My May West is a life preserver, a yellow life preserver. Had that on there. Then on top of that, I had my parachute harness. And we were lucky. We were issued British parachute harnesses. It was a buckle, you turn a quarter turn, slap it, and the harness is off. It wasn't like the old ones we were trying to tighten it up. Well, anyway, then we had 
protect our face, we had a helmet, earphones in the helmet, leather helmet, and oxygen mask and goggles. The early oxygen mask would freeze in high altitude. So I had a, uh, uh, a cover over my ass oxygen mask with electrical wires in it, I plug it in, and it didn't freeze. So that's how I dressed every day when I went on a mission. How long did it take to put all that on? What's that? How long did it take to put all that good, on? Good question. How long did it take to dress? Oh, I'd say about 30 minutes. And I'd do that just before we went to the revetment to get to our aircraft. And uh, we're ready to fly. Well, I'm going to tell you another story. Uh, let's see. That's the way I dress. All right, I'm going to tell you one uh, about when I completed my tour of duty. 35 missions, 54 sorties. Well, I was waiting for a ship to go home. How are they going to send me back home? Change of station. That meant I'm going home. I completed my tour. Well, anyway, the B-25 took, took me to Naples. And there I went to this rebel depot. People wait, you know, all GIs wait for a ship to go home. Well, I was there about seven, eight days. And finally the ship was there for us. And on this particular ship, it was a Liberty ship, and there was 28 sergeants, all guys in the 15th Air Force, that completed their tour in a major. That's all the troops that were on that ship. That's all. How lucky did a guy get, huh? Well, anyway, we all got on that ship, and we were the last convoy to leave Naples. The war ended six weeks earlier. And there was about 20 ships in the convoy. And then we take off, you know, about two or three days later, we were on the, we were at Oran, Algeria. Then we pick up another 20 ships. So we got about 40 ships in this convoy. And we're going as fast as the slowest ship in the convoy. Five or six knots, oh my God, we'll never get home. Well anyway, we took off past the rock of Gibraltar into the Atlantic. We were in the Atlantic about three or four days at least, and we're just south of the Azores, and all of a sudden, that convoy breaks up. Everybody's taken off in different directions at higher speeds. We found out that all the submarines were accounted for in the Atlantic, and therefore, no convoy required. Our ship took off for 15 knots, headed for New York Harbor. Man, I'm on cloud nine, you know. I'm going to be home soon. Well, I was at sea for 18 days. <laughs> and we got into New York Harbor. It was about 4 p.m. We didn't dock. So they anchored us about 200 yards from the Statue of Liberty. And there we could see lower Manhattan, the lights, the horns, everything, you know. And when the ship came into the harbor, there were the fireboats the tugboats blowing their horns, their whistles, and the tugboats making water sprays, and all other ships with flags welcoming the troops home, see? All other ships were coming in with troops. So we were anchored there all night. Oh man, it was, it was terrible, I'm sitting out there looking and listening to the noises of this lower Manhattan. Well, next morning, right away, everybody's up, eager beaver, you know? And we're heading to dark now, but we don't dock on the New York side. We dock over the Jersey side. <laughs> oh. And this ship was the first ship with troops that docked at that particular dock. Well, 10, 15, 20 minutes later, all the girls from the office buildings are coming down, coming on the ship, and we were their heroes. Oh, man. We were flying high, I'll tell you. Well, we were, the girls were on board with the rest, Red Cross girls were there too. Coffee, donuts, 
fruit, which we haven't seen in nine months, you know. And finally the trucks come to pick us up to take us to Camp Kilma. We're going there for processing. Well, we get to Camp Kilma and there they have, got there around lunchtime, they have a steak dinner for everybody. Oh, wow. all, all the steak you want, veg fresh vegetables, fresh fruit, all the milk you could drink, and all the ice cream you wanted. <laughs> well, I had three milkshakes. <laughs> well, anyway, after they fed us, they gave us a three-minute phone call, call our home, tell our folks we're okay, because they haven't heard from us for over a month. Well, anyway, then they took us on another bus and took us to the Grand Central Station in New York. There we got on a train, and we're heading for Fort Devens, Mass, since the 28 of us were all from the New England area. <laughs> well, we got to Fort, De uh, Fort Devens around midnight, and one of my buddies, Tony from Bristol, Maine, he says, hey, Greek, come on, let's go dancing. <laughs> Crazy, we gotta get up in the morning, it's midnight, come on. Well, he finally convinced me to go dancing. So we're looking for a bar with a jukebox. If you've got a jukebox, the probably girls dancing. Well, about 10, 20 minutes later, we walked out of the base, no pass, nothing. We just took off. And no one bothered us, no one stopped us. Well, 20, 30 minutes later, when we got into town, we found a bar. And then in the back corner was a jukebox all lit up, you know, all oh, beautiful. So Tony and I walked downstairs into the bar about four or five guys at the bar drinking. And in the far back corner, we see two waves dancing. Waves are the girls in the Navy. And they had their whites on. Man, they look great. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Tony and I walk over there, and the two girls are dancing. The two waves are dancing together. No boys. So I hit one on the shoulder, and they turn around and they face us. And one says, what in the hell we have here? <laughs> here we are, Tony and I, in our wrinkled khakis, in our damn boots, you know, the rough boots we wore. And so I said, look, we haven't seen an American girl. We just got off the boat this morning. We haven't seen an American girl in nine months. And all we want to do is dance. What? So they accepted us. We danced for a couple, oh, about maybe an hour and a half. And there's one song we danced to over and over again, cheek to cheek, you know? Oh. I'm on cloud nine, rubbing elbows with the stars. Yeah. You know? and, uh, and that one song was by Les Brown and his orchestra. And the vocalist was Doris Day. And the title of the song was Sentimental Journey. Man, what a homecoming. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs>